Welcome to Keep the Hotel Empty. I'm your host, Eric Paul. In studio today, we are grateful to welcome in Zeta and Taylor of the progressive pop band, The Tilt. In this episode, Zeta and Taylor discuss the band's origins, what fuels them creatively, and how they manage their different talents and perspectives to create a harmonious blend. Please enjoy. Welcome to Keep the Hotel Empty. Today we've kept the hotel empty to welcome in Z and Taylor of the band The Tilt. Pop, experimental, expansion, pantheon, cornucopia of sound they are. For those of you not familiar, we're going to start at the start. Guys, could you tell us how The Tilt comes together? That was a really good description. Thank um, you. It's amazing. Uh, how do we come together? Uh, so, like, it's a really long story, so I'll try to keep it to, like, the most the Spark Notes version. <laughs> um, but basically... Taylor and me, I think we started in, first in high school. In high school, in your garage, yeah. playing Slayer or whatever we were doing. <laughs> yeah. um, and when was this? This was wise. when I was 2010, about. Yeah, it was yeah, 2010. My freshman year of high school. Gotcha. So um, that started, and then slowly we got up a, a band with uh, Sawyer, and uh, it was our other uh, singer and guitar player. Um, and we were doing some sort of indie stuff. We put together an EP um, by the end of high school. Like, you know, we were still teenagers, very green. And uh, that band split up. And then th the earliest form of this band started in about 2018 when Taylor and myself and William got together, started playing. And then some time passed. Sawyer joined in. And that's sort of how this got going in this iteration, but we've all been playing music together in different, you know, configurations for a while. So what was the big inspiration in high school that got you going from just playing to we're going to start to be a band, we're going to try to jam with other people? I think we always wanted to. Oh, yeah. That was, that was kind of always the intention. Um, I had bands going back to middle school. Like, I had a really bad, like, six-piece new metal band in middle school. Like, <laughs> nice. Like... That was that was sort of always the intention, I think. And uh, Sawyer played drums in like a metal band um, at the time, uh, and I would sort of like I was kind of like a groupie. Like I was, I would hang around them, you know, and just think like, damn, if I had something like this, you know. Right. Uh, and Sawyer was a guitar player playing drums, so it was like, you know what? Let's let's get something going. Let's let's get you, you know, playing more of the music that you want to play and playing the instrument that you want to play and let's get something together going on the side. So that's kind of how that started. And then it went from there. Became the main band, basically. Yeah. 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 So what's the what's the link in the chain between the metal influence and, and the, the new metal beginning <laughs> of the show to where the tilt comes in? Well, when you start the tilt, are you thinking to yourself, we're going to we're going to totally shift gears here? Or how does how does that change come about? No, we didn't think about style really at all. I don't yeah. think because um, we've played all sorts of styles like forever. I mean, the the like the the metal band that Sawyer was playing in that didn't play into what we were doing on the on the side at all. That was more of like a indie thing or whatever. It was just what we wanted to do. Um, the the thing is just that the scene was very you know especially when we were in high school that was what it was geared towards but um, you know as we got older we just did whatever we wanted and that meant doing electronic music for a while and uh, I guess just what we ended up doing was is just a combination of what the four of us all do we all sort of bring all of our influences together and that kind of thing what yeah. would you say are the big the the cornerstones of the dna of the tilt because it's for people that haven't heard the music there's there's easily genre shifts amongst the same composition right so how do you navigate that well i mean basically it just comes from when we you know each of us is going through our own day-to-day -day lives listening to what we're listening to, being influenced by what we're influenced by in that particular frame of mind, in that particular part of our life. And I think we're always, each of us is constantly shifting with what that is, you know, whether we're in a, you know, one of us might be in like a punk phase and one of us might be in like a techno phase, but we're all getting together and practicing and everybody, there's no like lead songwriter or anything like that where one person's going to dictate like we need to go for this or whatever so it's just we all get together and then whatever everybody's 
vibing with, they're going to try to get what they want out of that song. You know, so right. somebody's listening to techno and they're like, I want to make a techno song. Nobody else wants to make a techno song. Well, you're going to figure out how to make a techno song inside of this non techno song, you know? So that's how it, uh, I mean, I don't think we really put too much thought into navigating it, like doing style shifts, like for the sake of doing style shifts, it's just sort of, um, that's sort of just our process, point. right? Yeah. yeah. So inherently the framework is almost no framework. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. So what are the big influences of that? Are you like John Zorn fans or where? I'm a huge John Zorn fan. That's a crazy yeah. catch actually. Okay. Yeah, see yeah. that, that's, I sort of picked up some of that in there yeah. with the, with the bit of brass and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. He's my favorite, um, alto sax player for sure. I play alto sax. I mean, I play saxophone generally, but like, uh, alto's sort of my first love on the sax and, you know, growing up playing saxophone, it was like, um, stuff like and we we knew we wanted to have that as part of our sound doing the saxophone stuff because um i mean well it's just like if you can do it and it expands your uh, palette then why not but also like live it's like a lot of people you know react to that so but you know growing up it's like uh all the cool saxophone players, in my opinion, were tenor players, you know, your uh, Pharaoh Sanders and John Coltrane and stuff. And it was like, oh, man, like I really picked the wrong, uh, <laughs> yeah, the wrong side of the things yeah, here. New metal and saxophone. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> well, a tough one. And then and then sort of seeing John Zorn, like how he made. I mean, of course, there's other people were net and stuff, but but uh, he really made alto cool to me. So, yeah, that's a big that's a big influence for sure. Compositionally. Definitely. So that was one thing I did want to ask, and you said, who, who plays the brass? It's you that's playing the saxophone on the recordings, I gather. Yeah. So yeah. maybe you could just tell us quick, who does exactly what in the band? Because there's a lot more instrumentation than just guitar, bass, drums. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, well, so I do, uh, of course, we, we all kind of contribute vocals in our own way. Um, it started with uh, mostly myself and Sawyer on vocals, um, but we've sort of branched out. Williams had some songs and uh, uh, Taylor's done some things here and there, especially like, you know, we've, Taylor's done some background vocals. Yeah, on, uh, so, some harmonies. Yeah. So we've all done vocals. Um, the uh, Sawyer and I split most of the guitars, well, maybe probably all the guitars, and then, you know, you sort of focus on. Yeah, uh, I pretty much focus on bass. Um, but you did play guitar on Water Street. Yeah, on Water Street, I played. Uh, I played guitar. Yeah. So um, and keyboards. And so keyboards. Done some yeah. Keyboards. I do most of the keyboards and um, the, uh, all the all the wind stuff. The uh, on the last record there was um, tenor, alto, sax, and clarinet. So we wanted to have that. That was like part of the sound of the last record that we did, I think, was having this sort of uh, more like compositional, because the first record was way more improvisational. It was mm -hmm. like we would go into yeah. the studio without a plan and just sort of, I mean, we'd have a song, but we'd have just an idea where a part is. Like, And did you track that live then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, well, not like we would go, go in after doing like uh, the drum tracks, the bass tracks or whatever, and then I would go in and just rip the sax and okay. we would, you know, take the best takes and stuff like that. Um, so it was very, and, and same with other stuff like that, the keyboards, uh, and, and a bunch of the crazy sounds were all just sort of on the fly stuff. Um, mm -hmm. so it was very improvisational, the first record. So the last record we wanted to do like a more of a compositional thing. So I wrote out, you know, parts for clarinet with my very limited understanding of how to write stuff so clarinet and sax and stuff like that sawyer played trumpet on the first record too so yeah we all kind of do a so lot. you're all yeah, yeah, obviously yeah, multi-instrumental yeah. what's yeah. your background on that do you guys have training or did you just kind of get enough to get going or how do you get to the point where you're multi-instrumentalist and not just playing guitar and not just playing bass so i think a lot of this happens because of sort of where we started uh, we most of us started in like um sc like school jazz bands. Yeah. Okay. We started there. That's where a lot of our jazz influence comes from. We did have a really good jazz program in yeah. in high school, and we had um we had four different jazz band classes that we could take. You know, like there was like a jazz band one, two, three, four for different skill levels. So, mm -hmm. and I think at the height of of 
of my enjoyment of school, I was in three of those. So, and, and it was an ex, it was an excuse to like play a different thing, you know. So if you played guitar in one jazz band class, you play saxophone in another and drums. Ah. In another. So it was like this I think that sort of thing was better. encouraged. Yeah. yeah, yeah, back where we grew up. Yeah, and then like um, even I I was in jazz band in college, and we were doing. You know, like uh, Cannonball Adder- Adderley. So we were doing like old jazz standards, but we were also doing uh, sort of like modern R and B. Like um, we did like September by Earth, Wind, and Fire. Oh, nice! So like it was one of those. Um, so that's that's more modern. That's like eighties, but more, or seventies, eighties, more more vo- more modern than like. 30s and 40s jazz but still a relatively involved composition especially from a bass point of view yeah definitely um and then like <laughs> we even did uh we did even did like uh, a bit of like free bird one time oh nice <laughs> one of the uh one of the people at um at my college was like the biggest fan of like Leonard Skinner and loved free bird so they were like <laughs> egging, egging the uh egging the like band program to play that so that's like i played that our biggest nice. influence is actually leonard skinner <laughs> right well yeah. and that was really obvious it was leonard yeah, skinner and totally john yeah, yeah yeah it's perfect yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how important would you say it was being able to have that exposure to a, a, a progression of your musical skill in high school and not necessarily have to wait till college and that it was encouraged mm. um i don't know i i, I think like if we honestly, if we didn't have that, I, I still like to think we'd all be like banging on badger carcasses yeah. uh, live or doing whatever. That's the only way could. to be original, yeah. I heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we would be doing something for sure. So, I mean, I don't think like, I mean, we were we were in bands before we knew how to play. <laughs> and I mean, I, I don't, we still don't know how to play. We're still figuring <laughs> it out. So, you know. Okay, so that's a, that's a hell of a lot of groundwork that gets you to Tilt Day 1. Do you remember your first rehearsal? Do you remember your first show? Do you remember when it comes yeah. together and you say, we're the Tilt now? I hit uh, I hit William's car with my car <laughs> I, on, Are you on our first practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I came to his house, and he kind of he kind of knew of our previous band, you okay. know? Um, we, we had met in college, William and I, and uh, so he knew of our previous band, and... Um, when the time came where I was sort of tired of, for a couple of years after our previous band, I was just sort of making stuff on a laptop, and uh, I think we all kind of were, and I was kind of tired of that for a little while, and I was just like, I want to do some rock and roll or whatever, you know, like, yeah. oh, let me hit up this drummer guy uh, and, that I met, and uh, so I came over his house, it was my first time over at his house, and on my way out, I backed into his car. <laughs> And he was totally chill with it, and that's when I knew, like, okay, this is uh, going to work out. <laughs> this will work. Yeah. So how long between hitting his car and first show? Two years. No, uh, it wasn't that it, long. It depends, on, it depends on how you ask, because uh, about, about a year later we played, um, but under a different name um, with mostly different songs. I mean, there were a couple songs that made it onto the first record in, like, very, uh, very modified forms. Yeah. But... Um, it's it's kind of like hard. It was this band, but it was like a very very embryonic version pre-pandemic. Yeah. So I think we got together for our first practice in January 2018. We played our first show um, literally like three weeks after Sawyer came on. Okay. Like Sawyer was like, I, I want to start coming by see what you've been doing. So he did and wrote some lyrics and started singing a bit and um we had this show lined up with like really no plans so we, and then we just we did that show so that was probably like may 2019 and nothing really else happened until you know post uh post pandemic post pandemic so how was post-lockdown. pandemic for you i know i know everybody handled that a little bit differently yeah. from the creative point of view how was it for you guys it was, i mean we wrote a record <laughs> so it was uh that was sort of when the uh, the idea factory, the musical explosion, happened with us. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. just had all this time. You know, nobody's doing anything, and yeah, I think that was the period where I mean, 
that was the period of like condensation where it like came together into what it would become yeah, you know definitely. Um, before that it was the four of us so it had that feeling of the four of us that uh, we still have and will always have but um, you know we didn't have a sense of well it's hard to say we didn't really have a sense of identity we didn't have the name at that time um, which I feel like is a part of the sense of identity but mm -hmm. but the identity has always been the four of us with no plan and no rules so there was that yeah. but um yeah i think that was the point that was the point where we started writing i mean we kind of started writing beforehand but that was the part where we really buckled down and we started recording and uh focused on making that first record so we did the uh we recorded the first record before anybody knew who we were and because we hadn't played live or anything like that. And we're not very, you know, tech social media savvy or anything like that. So we we didn't really know another way to sort of like build up hype other than playing shows, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, so we just spent that whole time working on a record. We completed the record during that time. And um, th then after finishing the record, we started playing shows and people were like, you know, who are these people? Like we don't we don't know who you are, and and we did that for about a year, just playing shows, and finally put out the record, and people are like, oh, you know, this is really cool. You put this record together really fast, but it's like, no, we, no, <laughs> we, we, had, this, we had this we done had this before any of you knew what was what yeah. anything about us. So, so clearly the compositions became more deliberate in the second go round compared to the first album. Mm, how yeah, how does that take shape? If you have this no rules thing and everybody has their own uh, m multitude of skill sets, how do you, how do you start to make that more deliberate? Well, I think that it was the first record was like, there was a very like apocalyptic feeling uh, going into that first record. I think uh, I mean, there, especially like just with the world, there was a very apocalyptic feeling at the time. It was the pandemic and et cetera. But um, I mean, of course there still is, but it's kind of, we've been lulled into this sort yeah. of fragile state of normalcy. Right. Um, but uh, at that time it was very much like, and it was our first record. So it was like kind of do or die, you know, like let's do this as if we'll never have another recorded uh like evidence that we existed as a band, you know, mm -hmm. let's do this as the, as though this will be the only one. So it kind of had everything, you know, whatever. And, and we worked on it for a long time. You know, we worked on it yeah. for a year and a half, um, from like first recorded note to last recorded note. So, and we were changing the songs, writing new songs that whole period. So it was, uh, it was, it was a very long process and during which we tried to sort of cram everything we thought we might ever want to do <laughs> into that process. Yeah. First record syndrome. Right, yeah, right, first right, syndrome, right. Basically. So after that was done, it was, it was, you would think, I think that it, it would be kind of like, we'd be creatively drained after that, but it was the opposite. As soon as we were done with that, we felt, I think, creatively liberated, like, oh, okay, like that's over. Now let's just write a record, you know? So let's that was the going. idea. That was the yeah. idea with the second one. Like, let's let's write this whole thing in a month and just make like a, rather than try to make this like opus of like, rather than try to write a record that is us for the last 20 years, as long as we've been alive, let's make a record that's us right now and only right now. Yeah. So that was the idea with the second one, I think. So what did you have to do differently or what did you have to learn new to let that take shape? We Instead of doing really things, uh, you know, the way to, to encompass 20 years. We were writing so fast. Yeah. Like, we were writing, like, uh, song after song after song after yeah. song. And we sort of co coalesced all the best songs sort of onto that record. That's kind of how we've always done it is, is writing songs like every week, like every time we get together, let's just write something new. Okay. Um, yeah. But for the first record, it was like, you know, we probably wrote, and I don't, I don't want to be that person because I know this cliche where people throw out a ridiculous number. And, yeah. You know, that can't possibly be true. But I do feel like we wrote at least like 50 songs for that record. Yeah. Um, and just threw away so many of them because it was such a long process. And, and, you know, by the end of it, we were feeling these songs more than we were feeling those songs we wrote months ago. So with the first one, or that was the first one. The second one, it was more like we wrote a certain number of songs and then we went, okay, that's the record. Like yeah. we can, 
we can sort of tweak things, but let's not go in in November and write new songs when we wrote the record in April, because that's going to be like, that's not going to be that snapshot of that very particular uh, time frame for us. So, yeah, so it's definitely yeah. important that your songs capture the time they were written in. Yeah. Yeah. How, so how do you navigate the writing process being that you guys can all bring stuff to the table? Do you really just, do you do it as the band sit in a room and do it in real time? Or does someone come in with a riff or I, you know, you mentioned doing stuff on computers. Do you come in with stuff pre pro? No, no, uh, nobody ever really comes in with a riff. I mean, there've been a couple things where it's like one of us has an idea, we'll put it in the notes app and we'll go, Hey, what about this? Even that is becoming kind of a, a, a thing we don't do anymore. Um, it really is just sort of no plan in the garage, you know, first thing, let's just come up with something new and we'll just jam. And um, that's really it. Like, I mean, we're a jam band at the end of the day because <laughs> that's what it all comes from is jams. And, and when, when there's a jam that uh, we're feeling like can become a song, we all sort of know that, I think. Yeah. And if there's, a, if there's a jam that three of us feel like can become a song and one of us doesn't, Maybe we'll go like, okay, let's let's try and work on that a little bit. See if we can get that person to come around. And if if they can't, then it's just not. I mean, yeah, it's it's really a unanimous thing. And I think usually those ones where it's like the one person was kind of holding out about it, <laughs> that that sort of means you weren't really onto something there. I think because uh, it it really is always the ones where we're all like, oh yeah, okay, that that sort of go the extra mile that's actually starting it's starting to get less and less like of that yeah well we're yeah i mean <laughs> don't want to get too into album three spoilers but yeah. oh yeah it's true yeah well that and that's what i get curious about you know how you how you make the decision which part sticks and which part goes especially when you know you say you're a jam band at heart you you know if you got these jams that are gold you got to fit them into a structure you know how because mm -hmm. i know it's a difficult for a lot of bands to write in real time together you know, for a whole host of reasons, people's habits and mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. Yeah. I think one of the things that gets tough for people is the silent communication that has to happen while you're playing. Yeah. How was that for you guys when you started? Or did, was that trust there in the, from the gate and you just built on it? Like he said, it's mm. getting better now. Mm. Or, or is this trust something you guys have collectively manifested? I think, well, it's, it's a combination of both. I think, I think we did have to write a lot of clunkers back in the day. You know, um, to get to this point where I think and 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 you've always done that in real time. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, in our bands before, not necessarily in our bands before, we were uh, we we didn't have a drummer in our first band, Taylor Sawyer and I. So we programmed all the drums. We structured songs like that. It was really like sitting down in chairs. So the whole idea was do the opposite of that for this okay. for this band yeah. from the very beginning. Um, but you know, I think. We do th keep things fairly simple. I think that sort of helps, you know. I mean, I think we think in very pop terms, you know. There are songs that aren't necessarily pop songs uh, style-wise, but structurally, uh, it, it's all quite simple, you know. it's um, That's sort of the way we think is not in these sort of amorphous uh, conceptual pieces, but as like okay, we've got a part, we've got a jam that we like. Is that a chorus or is that a verse? You know, that's that's sort of how we think. All right, well, if that's a verse, let's get a chorus. If that's a chorus, let's get a verse. Does this need a bridge? Eh, maybe. You know, that's kind of that's kind of how we do it. And, like, you know, within the first few hours from that first jam, we've got, like, a rough structure. And over the time, you know, especially if we're not, like, writing a bunch of new stuff like we weren't for the second record it was like we could refine it and sort of go like okay this transition from verse to chorus needs work or whatever but yeah so it's like this the i hate to say it but the the rules of pop music where you can start to flower your uniqueness from is that kind of how it goes for you you can you can uh go back to the well of this is a verse this is a chorus and then 
John Zorn around it because your songs, uh, I I read it with a little bit of a grain of salt when it says that you're an experimental pop band because I can hear a bit of like Talking Heads or like 80s style yeah. pop and whatever. But the songs are so much more than that, you know. So I'm wondering because I know people's music sounds different to them because they made it <laughs> than it does to everybody else. So I'm curious what parts of it sound like pop music to you, or is it that this is where the structural compass rose starts? Thank you for sticking with us. We hope you're enjoying the episode. If you'd like to make a difference and take your support to the next level, please visit our Patreon and consider becoming a member. Link in the description. Everything counts in large amounts. Thank you again. Now back to the show. Hmm. I think I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, in terms of like, does our music sound like Harley Rae Jepsen? Like, no. no. I, I, like, I love her, but no. Um, does listening to Carly Rae Jepsen sort of help us to understand um, what a strong chorus feels like or what a tight, concise pop tune feels like. Yeah. So in that sense, I mean, I think the, the pop influences are as strong, if not stronger, than the experimental influence. Because the experimental influence is not so much like listening to, like, for to come back to John Zorn. Like, it's, it's not like we listen to Naked City and take compositional influence from that really where we're like right. I want to change to 60 different styles in one minute like that's not really what we do but it's more just um, it's it's just experimenting literally you know it, let's take uh, a Rhodes keyboard and run it through Sawyer's pedals and see what sort of sounds we get that's that's yeah. sort of the thing but that's like superfluous like at the core the song is like pop Structurally, yeah. usually, there have been songs that aren't that way. Um, like Basil's Talisman uh, was like that ten-minute-long instrumental, and those were generally more often the songs where uh, there was sort of an idea, like um, on a notes app or something. Like, let's try and do something like this. Let's try and do. I know Basil's Talisman. Um, was inspired by uh, La Fiesta by Chick Corea. It was like, let's try to do something where th that song sort of has this big split, like four minutes in, it becomes a completely different song. Right. Yeah. And so we were like, let's try to do that. You know, that was the idea there. But I don't think, like I said, like the whole even coming to practice with a conceptual idea in mind is not really so much of a thing that we do anymore. Yeah, definitely not. So expectation is out the window. Yeah. 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 What helped you get to that point? It just never existed in the first place. Expectation, like, like, yeah. it, hmm. because I find a lot of people in creative endeavors, if they start with an expectation, either they get it and they're super happy, or it mires them and it ruins the whole experience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is that. That's exactly it. Is uh, you know we can expect that we'll sound like this band that we love or that band that we love. And at the end of the day, we won't because we're not those people. You right. Know? Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll just constantly be unhappy if that's the way we went about it. But if we just think like, use our imaginations to uh, imagine what this song at the end of the recording process is going to sound like, we're, we're just still trying to get closer to that. Um, and I don't think we're there. We're, we're never like, you know, when we imagine these songs in our heads, when we write these songs, I think we're all thinking of the studio. You know, we're kind of a studio band. We're a live band because, you know, we love playing live and 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 we love that interaction. But the songs don't come from thinking of them in a live setting at all. They come from thinking of it in a studio setting. I think we all have the, the end product in mind when we're working on it. And, um, you know, I, I still don't think that we've ever had a song really where like the end result is exactly what we envisioned it from day one, but I wouldn't want it to be, you know, I think we're edging closer to that. If we were at like 40% last time, we're at like 45% this time and we'll get closer with each record. And maybe before we, we die, we'll have a one that's like a 99.9%. There you go. And you don't yeah. want to kill all the fun of the pursuit. Exactly. Definitely yeah. I think that 1%, that 0.1% that's left over at the end, that's not what we wanted is probably what people will like. <laughs> so. Yeah. But if you have the fun in between, it was worth it. Yeah. Okay. So you get to the point where we're going to take it back a little bit in your pandemic. You can call these songs done. We're not going to go out and have these be these magnum opus pieces. Like you said, where does, how does the recording process start? You said you guys are studio 
oriented. What is that like for you? What was the process of recording the second album like? Hmm. It was uh, different from the first one, but it's same, yeah. th- it was the same process. Uh, like in terms of, we worked uh, with the same producer we've been working with for a long, long time. He, he produced our EP when we were right out of high school, um, so we've been working with him for ten plus years. Nice. Um, and you know, in that same space, but it, it it did go differently in terms of it wasn't so much like we were all. Um, sort of in there experimenting at the same time mostly i think there were some things in in personal lives that got in the way of that for the second record um which which i, th- I think it just created a different um atmosphere to work in for sure um but you know it's it's not a bad thing it was it was just a different way of working right and, um yeah. so like we came out with certain things like the interludes on that um which were mostly just me and William mucking about when when nobody else was there and stuff. And uh, so so there were certain, I guess I, I said that it wasn't so uh, improvised as the first one, but there were three tracks on there that were all completely improvised. So well, you a can't bit of a liar, <laughs> but but uh, yeah. So there was there was that aspect of it, but um, generally it was it was pretty smooth. I guess we knew a bit more of. Like, you know, we get a little less green each time we do it. So, yeah. right. you know, we, we we sort of go like, oh, that didn't work last time. So let's let's keep the things that worked and get rid of the things that didn't work. And we'll experiment with some more things. So that's kind of the formula. It's like 33% keep the things that work, 33% get rid of the things that didn't work, 33% let's try something new. Totally unknown. Yeah. yeah. And then maybe half of that, stuff we tried that's new on this last record worked half of it didn't so we'll keep that half that worked on this next one and toss that half that we didn't at least in a perfect world that's the idea yeah right yeah. well that's a good framework to be able to yeah. go on when you have no expectations because at least you got some <laughs> this fits here this fits there this doesn't fit at all right yeah. right right yeah so when did you finish that album um f- well, last notes recorded were in November 2022. Last uh, mixing was in February of this year, I think. Yeah. And you released it in June? Yeah. And what's the name of the record again? I'm sorry. It was, it was supposed, supposed to be, be heaven. heaven. That's right. I always wanted to say something Jinx. like heaven. Do, you owe <laughs> the song. do I owe you a soda now? You do owe me a soda. Oh, man. Under a roof. Don't forget it. Oh, uh, under a roof. Mm-hmm. That's Man. a tall order. Why was that a part of it? Those are terms. <laughs> yeah. That's so you know the other party's committed. Yeah, exactly. Of course. Yeah. So once the record gets done, you get a little bit of break in between. Did you how many singles did you release before you put it out? One. One. Yeah, one. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> you you've got you're the only band we've talked to so far that did it old school. Yeah, well we did we did five on the first record. So <laughs> <laughs> it was uh with with the first record we put out five singles and the first one came out uh a year and change before the actual album came out. Yeah. So people had literally half of that record for months and months and months. So, so we how's like, your feeling about that? Not necessarily as a marketing, how many ears we can get on our stuff, but from this is the art we made point of view. What's your feeling about that? Because you had both where you got to give away half the movie and then people see the movie and only half of it's debatably interesting because they've <laughs> learned the first half. Right, right. right. And you put out just one single where other people I've discussed that with have literally couched that as career suicide. <laughs> but I'm the guy that releases my stuff still on Tuesdays. So <laughs> I, I, I don't care. I, I'm, I'm yeah. fully suicidal with my, my music. But I'm wondering how it feels for you guys. Yeah. Well, we have stuck to Fridays, so we're a little, <laughs> we're yeah. a little traditional in that sense, I guess. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's the way. It yeah. is the way. Um, but I guess that uh, it, you know, giving away half the movie is is the conversation that we have. I think more so than you know, uh, getting as many people as possible to hear it. Because I mean, that does enter into it. But we're not. We haven't seen. We, you know, what we've had. The success that we've had has been like groundswell. You know, uh, live shows. And that sort of thing Um, in word of mouth. That's really what it's been. So it's like, you know, putting out five singles and hoping that one of them goes viral on TikTok or something doesn't really enter into the conversation for us. Um, But what does is, you know, let's not give away the whole record. So. 
I think from that standpoint, we do lean a little bit more that way. Um, but if we've got on enough, you know, excess material, maybe then, you know, we do like to, to keep, uh, putting things out. Yeah, the, the game, you know, it gives a, the face of rigidity where if you don't release a whole bunch of singles and you don't release them on Friday, you've got no chance. But, you know, you're saying that with your live element, you don't have to feel like it's career suicide if you don't placate to digital streaming standards. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And and it's also, I mean, but there is the flip side of it where those singles are some of the songs that um, because we put them out, you know, before the record and people had people had more time to soak up just that one single and I think that's kind of the art of the single right. is that when that comes out people don't have this whole record around it where they're like oh this is like a whole lot of music I'm going to like pick the few songs that on my first pass I liked the most and then I'm going to sort of get to know those intimately and right. the rest of the record I'm not really going to get to know as intimately with that one song it's like if you liked it, you're gonna get to know that song really well. So the, the one single that we did from that last record is one of our favorite songs to play live. It's always been one of our favorite songs to play live, but I think ever since we play, uh, put it out, it's become even more so uh, one of the songs that people, you know, we want to see us do, hopefully, yeah. I think. I, I think that's one of our mo more requested songs. <laughs> requested, yeah. Or requested, yeah. like where uh, if, if we didn't play it, yeah, people, people jokingly might, like, might be upset. Jokingly, but. like we're like a cover band or something like yeah, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that it's it's that, and then it's Sweet Home Alabama. Yeah. Right. Well, because the Skinner influence cannot right. be right. shuffled under the rug. If we don't play Sweet Home, it's a riot. Right. Yeah. Well, that's understandable. That's that's the calling card of diversity. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> you've got the new record out. Have you have you been playing a bunch of shows since then? What was what was the change of gear once you dropped the record? You mm -hmm. did just the one single and you dropped records. So what's the yeah. statement after that? Yeah, the statement was actually to uh, get immediately working on another one. Um, so uh, the we played a bunch of uh, shows in preparation for the record. Um, in this spring i mean i don't want to put a random number out there because i really don't know but for you know five five months or so we were playing on average more than once a week you know okay. maybe 1.2 times a week <laughs> you know? and there were there were some weeks where we did you know two three shows uh there were some weeks where we had no shows but uh it was really a lot of shows uh from you know uh late january to, to uh, early june uh this spring so we kind of hit it hard and uh we were we were a little bit worried how that would you know uh affect the record you know would would people be kind of tired of us by then or or would they be really anticipating it and i think what did end up happening was it, it completely worked in our favor people were uh the response to the record was fantastic and um so after that it was sort of like okay we don't want to you know become a band that's just sort of going through the motions and playing worse and worse every night, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we, we haven't played as many shows since the record came out. We've done, we've done only a small handful of shows since the record came out. I think things will start ramping up again, um, here soon. Um, but, uh, yeah, we mostly took, uh, the couple months after the record came out to start writing new stuff. Yeah. Because writing is really where your passions lie. Absolutely, Definitely. I think I think everybody in the band would give sort of a. I mean, it it might vary on two to three, um, but like first being uh, writing all day, and then yeah. second and third being studio and live. I think that might flip from member to member, but all of us, I think, we would put writing up top for the the thing that we're most passionate about. Yeah, definitely. That's very cool. That's definitely a unique thing as well, because you know most people are like, well, I do it all for the time I can be on stage. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got to uh, gotta do the the busy work, right. essentially, to do the to do the stuff where you can, you know, uh, show off your talents. Yeah. That kind of thing. I mean, playing live is really just a celebration of what you did in the garage. Yeah, pretty you much. Know? Yeah, like, definitely. It's like the time in the garage is really what we're doing this for. 
and then and then the live show is just like we get to share it yeah you get to be in our garage with us you know that's yeah. kind of so it's like uh, I hate to make a sports reference, but it's almost like the Kobe Bryant thing. You're not there because of winning championships. You're there because of four day workouts and five a.m.s and your yeah. time in the garage. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's an interesting take on it. I, I know a lot of people don't necessarily have that same take. So you guys employ a lot of old school philosophy. You played shows to promote the dropping of a record instead of after it. You only did <laughs> one single. You you're primarily concerned with writing instead of performing live or being you know celebrated on social media. Sounds right. like career suicide. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I, I very much uh, credit you guys for carving your yeah. own niche like that. I mean, I, I heard just it. Just don't in, show this to Capitol Records or Atlantic. Well, <laughs> and, and, until it turns that that becomes the desirable thing, and then they're all calling you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. true. <laughs> so, but you do have a live show coming up. Right. Yes. And yeah, it, it is, you do have a live show that's a bit anomalous in that you are going to play some covers, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's one of them. Yeah. And I know it's not a big backbone of, of your guys' identity by any stretch, but I think it's super cool. And then you got an original show after it. So tell us a little bit about that, because I think that's a cool little back to back you guys are going to have in a couple of weeks there. Yeah. So, well, the first record we've actually got, or record, the first uh, show that we've got coming up soon uh, is going to be. Um, a Friday the 13th show at Mojo Records in Tampa. Oh, nice. Um, after that, we are playing at Oscura in Bradenton. Um, we're doing um, a cover show of The Cure. And um, and then we're playing Oscura again, an, an original set, uh, the month following that with uh, um, Hover Car and just some, some really amazing bands. I mean, amazing bands on all these lineups. So we're really excited. Um, the... The cover show is kind of something where we debated it for a bit um, because it was just such a not us thing to do. Right. And I think maybe the thing that put us over the edge was exactly that. Like, it's so antithetical yeah. we can get yeah. away with it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like this is maybe something that people wouldn't expect us to do. So let's do it. You know? Um, yeah. And How'd you pick the cure? Well... Because Taylor already knows every damn Cure bass line. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> and you got a chorus pedal and a flanger pedal to make it oh, happen. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. We're in then. Yeah, they're one yeah. of our favorite bands, and we all went to see them um, a couple months ago. Uh, so uh, there was that aspect to it. Um, yeah, they're still really good. Yeah, yeah. incredible, incredible band. Um, uh, yeah, and it, it's Halloween, so you know we were like, oh, we can play some spookier sort of stuff. Is and, someone going to do Robert Smith hair? Absolutely. Okay, good. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I had Robert Smith hair all through high school. Well, okay. not all through high school, but mostly. All right, fantastic. Yeah. That's good. So how are you going to approach doing that? Are you going to try to do them traditional like they were, or are you going to detiltify them? Well, that was one reason why The Cure was such a good band for us to do, I think, was because, first of all, there's a lot of diversity in their music already. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was something that sort of, that's something that speaks to us is, is being that sort of band of two sides in a way, or many sides, you know, because they've got that sort of like, pop uh just like no frills complete pop yeah, stuff, yeah you know and then they've got that stuff that's just like i mean the closing track off pornography is just like a tape loop nightmare <laughs> so you know they've really got it all so i think that spoke to us in that way and so there's already diversity there for shared us to dna with. Yeah, yeah shared dna from like the the pop side of the dark side because we kind of do that too but it was also like they're really good songs to sort of stretch out in, you know, especially the uh, the early stuff, the the more gothy stuff or whatever, and the uh, the disintegration stuff. Um, it's not so much like verse, chorus, verse. You have to do everything this way. Um, a lot of those songs are just sort of an ocean to lose yourself in. Right. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that was like a, that's a really good uh, place for us to sort of tiltify them you know do our thing um because these songs sort of stretch out for a while it doesn't need to sound like the way the cure stretches out with uh you know uh, just the the way that those guys play together it would be the same songs and stretching out in the same way but they would sound the way that we sound when we do that yeah. very cool so what's your favorite one you're doing? Do you got them all picked out already? We do. We haven't. Well, mostly we've been kind of uh, discussing some, uh, throwing some last second changes in there. Think, but um, thinking about uh, Lullaby. Oh man, I yeah, love that song. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, love Cats <laughs> would be cool. I said Love Cats yeah, would be cool. That's a great tune too. Yeah, but uh, um, geez, what is? I I I think we each give a different answer for this, but probably the one I'm most excited for is Fascination Street. 
Nice. Cause that's, uh, that's one of my favorite songs, but it also, it, it, it really epitomizes that sort of like stretching out sort of feeling. Yeah. And I think that that one is going to be really, really free for us to explore and do our thing. in. yeah, that's a cool one off thing to do just to stretch your legs as a band a little bit and then yeah. put that in the closet and go back with what you learned. Right. Definitely. Yeah. It was sort of like, we didn't learn how to write songs by covering other bands. Now that we've learned how to write songs though, let's prove to ourselves that we can do this. Right. Yeah. So you've been doing a bunch of fun stuff. You got a cover gig coming up. You got your own gigs coming up. You got a Friday the 13th show coming up and you've been writing. What's the time frame for this writing? Are you going to try to put the pedal to the metal and get another record out sooner? Or are you going to let this one breathe for a couple of years like last time? Pedal to the metal. Pedal to the metal. All, all, day. all the way. Yeah. I think it, that's another kind of old school mentality that we have is... Um, <laughs> Don't edit that. Oh. <laughs> um, Genius of love. That Genius can interrupt. Love, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, my whole train of thought gone. Um, so, yeah, pedal to the metal. Uh, we really liked the idea. Of, and then this is actually was something that we talked about um, in the early days of the band was, you know, the 2020s are coming up. Uh, <laughs> And we really love those uh, artists. Some of our favorite artists all sort of hit. I mean, there's there's artists of ours, artists that we love that sort of have been more sparing with their records. But I think some of our favorite artists, you know, like Bowie in the 70s uh, or Eno in the 70s or, or, or maybe even the Tom Tom Club. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, the, or the Cure in the 80s. They sort of hit it. And, and that was their decade to go out and just, I mean... The Cure did what, like eight records in 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 the eighties, right? And Bowie did God knows how many records in the seventies, and they're all great, um, especially the Berlin, yeah, ones. Yeah. yeah, yep, yep. That's low. I got it. Yeah. Out. I, yeah. I can't live without that album. Yeah. So I think that was sort of our idea, and 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 they stretch out so much. You know, they find who they are by doing all those records, like a a, a Cure record from. 82 the pornography the cure record from 82 does not sound anything like a cure record from 87 you know like that's just a five-year span in in that span of time there's a lot of bands that you know will put out one record in each of those years and they'll sound exactly the same you know Mm -hmm. we won't we didn't want to be that we wanted to be the band that that puts out five records in five years and the first one sounds completely different than the last one so yeah and the cure they make it all the way on their road to working with ross robinson and recording live <laughs> yeah. and doing the whole yeah. corn <laughs> doing this corn stuff. unplugged yeah. so so yeah. where where do you see what what ideally do you see your progression being like what are the some of the things you want to incorporate in this well next i five absolutely years? want to play unplugged with corn yeah <laughs> No question. No question. And yeah. cover Sweet Home Alabama. Yeah. yeah. With corn. With corn. Yeah. 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 Pipes. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, Big yeah. Pipes, Alabama. Uh, yeah. Or we'll just, uh, we'll talk, talk it and we'll just, we'll make a really great record and disappear off the face of the earth. Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, is this more of like a, you know, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Yeah. Now? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to do things where you start to record live or, you know, do completely turn some of your things on its head or do you just want to add to the things? <laughs> well, we do love adding to the things. We're pretty addicted to that. But I think uh, we always want to just sort of do the opposite of what we just did. Um, like with the first couple records, the first record was, like I said, very maximalist. And uh, and, and it had a, a very positive uh, lyrical message. That was the whole idea of tying it all together was e- even though the music was all over the place, the message was consistent. And so for the second record, we didn't really plan it this way, but the second record ended up being quite minimalist and quite dark. So I think we just sort of have a tendency to uh, whatever we just did, we don't want to do that again, you know? So I think that's the way it'll continue until, I don't know, we run out of things to do, but I think that's kind of how we, I think that's kind of how we don't get stuck as sort of a band is that we, we just keep expanding because, I mean, if we do the same thing just over and over and over again, yeah, there. And we're going not quickly, going, to, going quickly, kind of helps with that. Yeah, because it's sort of, you know, you know, there's going to be another one. So nobody's left out in the cold. Like, oh, I really liked what we did on the last one. Why are we going in a different direction with this one? It's like 
don't worry, you'll have your, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come back, you know, or and not necessarily like we'll do the next record like we did the last one, but it's just the, that mentality of there'll be another record. And that's not to say we're not all on board because we are all on board with anything we decide to do, but yeah. we can afford to get all on board like that because we all know there's going to be another record and we don't need to sort of fit everything we want to do into this one. We can make this one as good as we can with these parameters and then we can figure out what the next one is. With sort of the idea as the DNA develops and and starts to take more of a face, then these are things that will bubble up in the future without having to think about it. Yeah, and I think yeah. they already kind of have. Um, you know, whatever... Whatever somebody could describe as our sound being uh, is completely unintentional. It's just things that have bubbled up from, you know, doing what we do. On If there's consistencies between the first and the second record, they're completely accidental. <laughs> yeah, right. Just merely because it was the same yeah. humans. Right. Yeah, right. That would be the yeah. only. And that'll be how it is in 10 years, I'm sure. We'll, the process might be completely different, but it'll still be the four of us. So it'll still feel like the four of us, I think. Yeah. That's awesome. So it seems like you guys can really take away a big amount of gratitude from the fulfillment you get from writing, you know, and then you can do all of the things that go along with it. You can take away the, the gratification of having written and having done something, the four of you in real time. That's definitely a unique experience. I'm wondering how much you think about it or what you would like for the listeners to take from it, because I know the listener can inherently take some of the uh, process that went into it when they hear your music. This was clearly not something people slept on. This was deliberate. This was intentional. But they don't get to take away your gratification. With your vibe of your music, what do you hope your listeners take away when they hear your stuff? Hmm. <laughs> well, I think all of us sort of got into music uh, because of somebody. You know, we can we can pretend uh, that that's not the case, but that's of course the case with every musician, it's, right? And and what we all want is for uh, somebody to hear us, and I think that's one of the reasons that we make music in a sort of a, a pop format rather than just go full um, Schoenberg or whatever. You know, it is is uh, because we don't want to just play to people like us now you know we want to play to people like us 10 15 20 years ago too so you know if if somebody wants to pick up a instrument or you know do something artistic uh and in some small part was inspired by us uh because of course all of us you know we weren't inspired by one person we were inspired by the myriad of life experience and going out and seeing art from every direction and thinking like, that's what I want to do. I want to be an artist because my life is better because of art. Right. You know? Yeah. So if somebody's life is like one tiny fraction of a percent better because of our art, you know, then that's completely. Then the circle purpose. completes. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. I think that's a very important thing. It's very cool that that's, that's your sentiment. So I know that's a heavy one. We can get you out of here on something fun, mm. okay? Mm. You can put together a dream tour mm. or a dream recording session, Ooh. since I know you guys love the studio. What What's the dream tour or what's the dream recording situation? Okay, you got to take this first. Oh, I get to take it? Okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't have uh, I didn't have something pre-prepared for oh, this. Oh no, they never do. They mm. never do. So, <laughs> um, I think the last answer was Metallica and Devin Townsend together. Oh wow! So, oh, that would so, be awesome. Uh, Who'd you have in here, Georgie? Um, <laughs> no. Um, the the gentleman from Appear on Bound. Why is his oh, name escaping okay, me right okay. now? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he so that would be a so, cool tour. Yeah, so you, all bets are off. You make all the rules. Who it is? But okay. they have to be alive, though, right? No, I don't, <laughs> I don't care. I'm not gonna put that heat on. Uh, okay. Um, so it'd be weird if they were. And the reason why I ask is because I, I I'm curious to where you see your your music sit ideally in a fantasy world. That's why mm, I asked that okay. question. Okay. Um, hmm. I'll start. I'll start with a recording session. Um, uh, a recording session with the four of us, um, with Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Oh, definitely. And Joni Mitchell. 
Yeah. Oh, nice combo. All, all together, yeah. Um, I would say, like, uh, Susie Sue. And then, like, um, this is a band I just saw recently. I saw um, I saw Melt Banana. Oh, yeah. And they're probably my favorite Japanese hardcore band. Yes. And I saw them with... Uh, out of Von Sirach and nice. then, um, and then Igor. Oh, I love Igor. And they were incredible. Like all of them were. Um, but I would love. I was gonna say that'd be a hell of a build just to drop you guys out right there. Yeah. 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 I would love to do. Um, I would love to be like even in the same studio as Mel Banana. Like that would be incredible. The fiasco would be on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that's when your cornucopia would go exponential. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I want to play one of those. Uh, I want to play one of those big uh, butt rock festivals. <laughs> <laughs> I want to play Welcome to Rockville. That would be awesome. <laughs> it would be cool if Danny Wimmer, whoever books that stuff, actually did throw a curveball on those bills, yeah. so yeah, it wasn't definitely. so monoculture. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I I don't know. Like, hasn't like a hundred Gex been getting put on some yeah. of those bills? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah they did one. Come it on. was like um, hit us up. It was like Gabber style hyper pop kind of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You love that. No one drops a Gabber reference anymore. <laughs> <laughs> love that stuff. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you guys coming down. I think everything you're doing is super cool. I encourage everybody to go check out your music. We'll definitely have links in the bio to everything. Um, look forward to seeing you live. I hope I can catch that Halloween show because uh, I feel I'm going to be a fan of you and a fan of the cure. I already know I am. So <laughs> onward and upward, I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Yeah, no yeah. problem.